Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Guan. I'm the incoming chair for the Communications Committee. And on behalf of the Resident Fellow section for SIR, I would like to welcome everyone to tonight's very informative session on pediatric interventional radiology, a day in the life, presented by Dr. James Park and coordinated by Jamal Jefferson from the Pediatrics Service Line. Before we get started here, I'd like to remind everyone that this session will be recorded and be made available on YouTube afterwards. Uh, you are free to watch the video anytime you'd like by searching um, for RFS webinar, Pediatric Interventional Radiology. Um, and if you guys have any questions anytime throughout the session, uh, feel free to write them in the questions box and then we will wait till the end to address them. Without further ado, I will give the screen over to um, the Pediatrics Service Lines, Jamal Jefferson, Dr. Park for tonight's presentation. And then Jamal, you can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. All right, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. James Park. Um, Dr. Park and I met a couple years ago at a uh, symposium at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. So um, get out and go to the symposiums and, and meet different uh, uh, physicians and uh, build some relationships. Um, Dr. James Park is a board certified diagnostic and interventional radiologist. He's currently practicing pediatric and general interventional radiology at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. His current title is Assistant Professor of Radiology um, at UPMC. He graduated from Cornell University with a degree in genetics and developmental biology. He then completed his MD PhD at State University of New York uh, Downstate Medical Center, uh, which in New York we call SUNY Downstate. Uh, he went on to complete his radiology residency at St. Barnabas Medical Center in Livingston, New Jersey, followed by a fellowship in uh, vascular and interventional radiology at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland, and finally a pediatric IR fellowship at Boston Children's. His current clinical research uh, interests are in interventional oncology, particularly tumors involving the liver, and developmental biology and vascular anomalies and malformations, including but not limited to lymphatic and venous malformations. Uh, without further ado, tonight he will give us a glimpse of a day in the life of a pediatric interventional radiologist. Dr. Park. Well, thank you, Jamal. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jamal Jefferson and, and Justin Guan for, for organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, it really is a pleasure for me to to spend some time uh, to talk to you about uh, just uh, what what uh, the pediatric IR service is like at, at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, basically, I'm I'm a you know I'm kind of a hybrid. I, I spend half my time at Children's Hospital and half my time on the adult side. Uh, so I split my time among uh, multiple sites in the uh, UPMC system. And the UPMC system is, uh, is composed of multiple sites, as you can see here, uh, spread pretty much all across uh, Pittsburgh proper and the surrounding uh, suburbs. Um, basically, um, it's, a, you know, it's a big system, but um, it's, not, it's pretty easy to get around Pittsburgh, actually. It's, it's not as uh, spread out as it looks like on this map here. Uh, this is a, a view of uh, Children's Hospital. Um, it's a 1.5 million uh, square foot facility uh, in the Lawrenceville section of Pittsburgh. Uh, there are 415 beds, uh, 62 beds in the um, in the ED, uh, 36 beds in the in the PICU, and uh, 12 beds in the CICU. So, how do you become a, a pediatric IR? Uh, there are various pathways. The traditional pathway um, you can do a traditional uh, diagnostic radiology residency after a year of uh, internship. And then you could either uh, do a diagnostic pediatric radiology fellowship uh, for one year and then go into pediatric IR, or you can do an adult IR fellowship and then go into a pediatric 
IR fellowship. Um, the, in the new pathway for the integrated IR residency, um, you can actually uh, do six years in a, in a combined DR IR residency pathway, uh, which is composed of one year of internship, three years of uh, diagnostic radiology, and then two years of two years of IR, and then um, either do uh, or, or you can actually you can go after that you can go into a pediatric IR fellowship, or um, you can do an independent IR residency and then do a pediatric IR fellowship. So there, there are various ways uh, to get into pediatric IR. So we're a group of four IRs. Um, we're actually a pretty diverse group. Dr. John Crowley is from Ireland. Uh, Sabri Yilmaz uh, is from Turkey. Um, uh, Chido Vera is from uh, Zimbabwe. And I'm actually from, uh, well, I'm actually of uh, South Korean heritage. So we're a very diverse group of four IRs. Uh, we do have uh, mid-level providers uh, who are very helpful in uh, doing procedures such as venous access and uh, GJ uh, catheter changes, things like that, rounding on patients and, and fielding consults. So we have actually two rooms uh, that we set up. We have a, good, a pretty nice setup. We have uh, one, uh, as you can see here, uh, a Siemens biplane unit, as you can see here, and also a, uh, a single plane unit. Um, so we have actually, uh, we rely on uh, anesthesia quite a bit. Usually there's one anesthesiologist and, uh, and two CRNAs that service all of our procedures. And then we have our nursing staff and tech, uh, radiation, radiation technologist staff as well. So we really rely very heavily on uh, anesthesia, um, uh, and, and uh, they're very helpful to us in terms of getting getting our uh, patients comfortable. And these are some of our uh, nursing and and uh, radiation technology staff and, and other support staff. So I really want to sing the praises of our of our support staff because. Uh, they're very thorough, and as you can see here, this is one example where uh, the nurses, we were doing a procedure that was completely unrelated to the abdomen, and basically they were able to find, uh, just incidentally find that this patient had a, actually a tick bite, as you can see there. So I'm, I'm, I'm always the first to sing, or sing the praises of our, of our support staff. Um, we also have a, uh, a, t a child life team that, that uh, Kind of just uh, helps us, um, you know, just get the patients comfortable, just get the kids comfortable uh, in the room. Uh, distraction with like iPads with videos and and uh, this is Nicole Steele, uh, one of our music uh, therapists, who actually come into comes into the room and, and sings to the patients and and uh, and tries to get uh, the patients um, uh, nice and comfortable before the procedure. So I really want to emphasize, um, you know, especially in pediatric IR, uh, the multi multidisciplinary approach. Um, we, we have not only our IRs but and diagnostic radiologists. Uh, we work with our referring physicians and anesthesia, our mid level providers, our our trainees, our medical students, fellows, and residents, our RTs and nursing, and uh, child life uh, staff all together, uh, working as a team. And as uh, the African proverb uh, says, it takes a village to, to raise a child. Uh, 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 it also takes a village to perform a pediatric IR procedure sometimes. So what's a typ typical day like in, in, in pediatric IR? Um, we spend our days fielding consults and rounding on patients on the floor. Uh, in addition to doing procedures, uh, typical procedures, Pretty much bread and butter IR, uh, similar to uh, an adult service, uh, mainly vascular access, GI feeding tubes, uh, biopsies of all kinds, usually kidneys and livers, but we also do bone biopsies, um, soft tissue biopsies, lumbar punctures, arthrography, uh, pain management. We do uh, steroid injections for kids who have uh, juvenile idiopathic 
idiopathic arthritis and uh, basically enjoy, inject any, any joint pr pretty much from head to toe. Uh, we also do all kinds of drains, abscesses, biliaries, and nephrostomies. So basically those are pretty much the bread and butter cases that we do in, uh, in PEDS IR. Um, I also wanted to go over some cases. Um, basically the main difference between an adult IR and pediatric IR really is vascular anomalies. Um, but that really deserves, I'm not really gonna talk about vascular anomalies today because it really deserves uh, a separate talk on its own because the, the field is just so vast and there's just so many entities to talk about. But I really want to just give you like a flavor of the types of cases that we do. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few cases, just pretty much like a show and tell. Um, here, case one, we have a 17-year-old female with history of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, seizure disorder, um, and has a metaport that's dysfunctional. Um, you can flush forward, but you have no blood return on, on the port. Um, so basically, this is a patient, you can see in the middle of these uh, large, um, you know, spinal hardware. Um, and this patient has a left-sided metaport that enters the, right, the left IJ vein. And you can see here that um, uh, basically we're injecting the port. And on injection, you can see that there's actually contrast going back up along the uh, the path of the catheter, and generally what you want to see is just free flow away from the catheter down into the heart. And so here, um, this is pretty much what we call a fibrin sheath, which is pretty common. And you can see there, the, the, the contrast is basically just getting held up. So generally in these patients, um, they've had these catheters for a long time. They're very debilitated, they have chronic uh, medical problems. You know, we do our best to try to salvage these ports. And so in this particular patient, what we did was uh, basically what we call a fibrin sheath stripping. Uh, we basically access uh, their femoral veins and just snake a catheter up uh, into the IVC, into the right atrium, and basically try to disrupt that fibrin sheath, as you can see here. Uh, basically, we put up a catheter, uh, just a reverse curve catheter up here, and, uh, and just try to disrupt that vibrant sheath. And you can also put up a, like a gooseneck snare. And that's pretty much what we're showing there. And you can just take the snare, uh, loop it around the catheter, and, uh, and just strip that, that sheath, that vibrant sheath off the catheter. The advantage of doing this also is you can actually reposition the catheter as well. You can see here that the catheter has sort of sort of um, retracted a little bit. The tip of it, usually you would like it a little bit lower down. And the advantage of um, using a snare is to try to pull it down into the proper position. And here we have a follow-up uh, DSA image injecting the catheter. And you see just the, how, how um, the contrast goes forward and does not kind of pull right up alongside the, the, uh, the catheter. All right, so I have a companion case, case number two, six-year-old with uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Um, also has a dysfunctional port, uh, which flushes and does not have any blood return. So this is a very similar, uh, similar uh, case. And you can see here, we're injecting the port, and it's a little bit more subtle. You can actually see contrast sort of hanging up along the catheter there. And on a DSA image, um, we've actually put it, placed a catheter from the groin, uh, gone past the, the uh, brachius valve vein into the subclavian vein. And on, on injection, you can actually see a large filling defect here, kind of associated with the catheter there. So again, we just put up a, a reverse curve catheter and it just basically, you know, just mechanically to try to disrupt any uh, big clot there. And again, uh, you can put a gooseneck snare and just try to strip that fibrin sheath off. And you can see this is the uh, post image GSA. 
So those are kind of bread and butter uh, cases. A lot we do a lot of venous access um, for a lot of these chronically ill uh, children with cerebral palsy and seizure disorders. Um, you know, the venous access really is uh, their their lifeline. All right. So moving on to case three. Um, this is a 14-year-old female with no no past medical history, um, and she just showed up one day with acute right upper extremity swelling. And she had an ultrasound done, and basically, um, this is the ultrasound of the right arm in cross section. And basically, you're seeing flow within the brachial artery, but not in the veins. And um, she went on to venography. We basically accessed her veins from uh, the brachial approach and did a, a venogram. And you can see here that on early filling of the veins that there's a large filling defect in the middle of the vein. You can sort of see tram tracking there. And on further injection, you can see just a very small wisp of contrast getting past the, the thoracic inlet into the uh, brachiocephalic and the IBC. And you see a lot of collateral vessels uh, kind of forming around like alternate channels. And basically indicative of a, uh, a high grade obstruction right at this area right here. And um, this basically is another venogram. And basically what you do is, uh, what we've done here is just change the position of the arm to see if that would uh, change things. A lot of times uh, with this entity, you can actually uh, worsen the obstruction by uh, abducting the arm. And on, in the, on this injection, you can see, again, high-grade obstruction right here at the thoracic inlet. Uh, there is a wisp of contrast going through, but a lot of, con of collaterals surrounding the area. So basically what we did for this patient was uh, catheter, what we call catheter-directed thrombolysis. Uh, we put up a, an infusion catheter through the same access. Uh, we basically put the catheter up over the wire. And you can actually see there's a marker here. Um, and I think you, can, you may be able to make it out there, but that there's another marker demarcating the uh, uh, basically the active zone of the, of the thrombolysis catheter. So, these catheters have little side holes um, kind of laced all around, all throughout um, the length of that active zone. And basically, we, we lice these patients using um, Alteplase overnight, usually a dose of about 0.5 to uh, 1 milligram of, of Alteplase uh, per hour. And we usually take it between 12 to 18 hours. And uh, we brought the patient back the next day, and here you can see another injection. And, you know, there's improved flow. I mean, there's, there's a lesser degree of collateralization, as you can see here. And you see more of the contrast flowing forward. But again, you see this very persistent um, impingement on the, um, on the, on the subclavian axillary, axillary subclavian vein at the, at the level of the thoracic inlet. And here, what you can actually see is some, some thrombus as well, kind of uh, adherent to the, uh, the side of the side of the vein. So basically, um, you know, this is basically what we call Paget-Schroeder syndrome. Um, uh, Paget-Schroeder syndrome is also known as venous thoracic outlet syndrome or effort thrombosis. Um, uh, basically, it's um, uh, you, you have right upper extremity subclavian DVT formation. Um, and this happens in, in relatively healthy young adults uh, with a two to one male to female predominance. And basically this is due to a um, anatomic, uh, basically an anatomic uh, uh, impingement on the, like an extrinsic impingement on the subclavian vein by the first rib and uh, either a hypertrophied scalene muscle or subclavius tendon. So these patients, like you, um, you know, we can we can thrombolyze them all day, every, you know, for several days, and they, they, this that will not fix this uh, this stenosis here because of the extrinsic compression. Uh, and the only way to really fix this um, is really surgery. And this patient 
uh, went to th surgery and had thoracic outlet decompression, adhesiolysis of the uh, right axillary subclavian vein. He had a right um, so first rib resection and also a, a right subclavius muscle resection as well. And um, what they did was they actually uh, venoplasty of this patient. And however, the, the stenosis was still very, very um, refractory. And you can see that it was probably this, this uh, chronic clot that was still um, kind of occluding the area. So they actually wound up placing a stent to, uh, to stent this open. Uh, they placed it a 12 millimeter by 40 millimeter cordis stent. All right. So basically the role of, um, of IR here uh, really is a bridge to surgery. So, you know, a patient presents with acute uh, right upper extremity swelling, they're, they're in pain and a lot of discomfort. Uh, basically you wanna just open them up and decompress things um, up until a time when they're able to go uh, to, for definitive surgery. And basically IR here uh, really is uh, uh, serving as a bridge, as a bridge to surgery. Alrighty, um, somewhat related case. Another uh, young person, 18 year old female, uh, presenting with very severe acute lower, left lower extremity swelling. Uh, she had a history of uh, oral contraceptive use. Um, it was a summertime, so probably dehydrated. And there was a concern for some, some sort of thrombophilia, a history of thrombophilia in the family as well. So she underwent a, um, an MRI. Um, uh, usually we go straight to a, an ultrasound first, but I'm not quite sure why she went to an MRI, but she had an MRI. And basically you can see here, there's a, di a difference between the, left, the right side and the left side. And basically uh, you could see that there is filling of the vein, the uh, left uh, femoral vein, uh, basically loss of signal and uh, just acute thrombus. It's just the, the, the vein here is just completely occluded with, uh, with, with uh, thrombus. And uh, basically just showing um, as we go up in the abdomen and the pelvis um, up towards the iliac vein, again, you see here are the arteries and here's the right common iliac vein and the left common iliac vein. And you see the dark signal there. And basically, again, uh, you can see here, just the signal differences, bright signal and dark. So there's complete occlusion of um, her venous system all the way up to the bifurcation uh, to the IVC. And on ultrasound, she basically was swollen, you know, uh, thrombosed all the way down to her calf uh, and very, very, she was in very, very um, uh, uh, much just discomfort and pain, uh, difficulty walking and, and just severe swelling in the left lower extremity. So next step was uh, we went to venography. Um, just to orient you, this is the left leg. We have this patient in the, in the prone position and so we're coming from the uh, left popliteal vein, and here you can see our sheath. And we're just injecting very, very slowly, very gently, uh, a little bit of contrast, and just following it up, following it up the leg. And we place a, a small uh, comfy catheter, um, and again, injecting very, very small amounts of contrast, and just following it up all the way up into the pelvis. And here, we're, we're, uh, this is a digital subtraction image, Basically, we're, we've made it all the way up to the, um, the bifurcation. Um, in this particular patient, we actually placed a filter before the procedure, an IVC filter, uh, just because of the extent of the clot. And we were just, um, she did have, there was some worry that she uh, might've had a, a pulmonary embolism. So just as a prophylactic measure, uh, we did place a, an IVC filter. Um, but you can see the catheter up uh, going up the the right the left this is actually the left iliac uh, common iliac vein and come coming to the confluence here's the right iliac vein and we're just injecting a small amounts of contrast some of it reflux down into the into the right side and you can see here that there's quite a bit of 
you can kind of imagine where the IVC would be, there's quite a bit of thrombus going up towards the uh, towards the uh, towards the filter. So what we did for this patient, again, just as we did in the uh, in the uh, Paget Schroeder case, uh, we put an infusion catheter up here. We see the marker and um, so basically thrombolyze this patient overnight with uh, with Alteplase TPA and brought the patient back the next day, did a venogram. And it looks like there's better, some, you know, improved flow, but there's, again, um, you know, lots of uh, filling defects within the veins, um, residual clot. And then this sort of configuration here, which um, pretty much looked like some sort of, like an, like an extrinsic compression on the vein if you can imagine something compressing on the vein from outside the vein. So basically, the next thing that we did was um, try to clear out some of this clot, and we used just mechanical, thromb uh, thromb uh, mechanical thrombectomy using an angiojet device. And basically, it's just like a rotor rooter device. Uh, basically, infuses... Um, it's basically like a real, what we call a rheolytic device. It injects a high pressure saline and um, just physically macerates the clot and then sucks it up um, uh, through the catheter. So basically we just ran the angiojet up and down. And that looks like it, it cleared things up a little bit. And we can see that some of those clots have cleared out. But again, you have this really, um, uh, persistent uh, compression on the vein. And we, again, uh, mechanical, mechanically try to break things up using a balloon, try to open things up, plastic open. Um, and eventually what we did is, was we uh, placed a, uh, a, uh, a wall stent across that, uh, that compression. And you can see here, that um, you know, we, we had pretty decent flow, it's not perfect. Um, it turned out in this patient that her inflow was very, very compromised. Um, and so um, basically this stent actually shut down um, uh, pretty soon after the placement, and um, which is kind of unfortunate. But we basically you know, brought her back, we, we uh, started her on anticoagulation and um, wrapped her legs with compression stockings and basically let the anticoagulation work on her legs. Um, and we were fortunate enough to get her open lower down in her body, in, in her leg, uh, to um, be able to come back and recannulate uh, this uh, stent uh, at a later date. And she actually wound up doing uh, pretty well. Um, after some physical therapy and uh, further anticoagulation. So this patient had May Thurner disease, um, May Thurner syndrome, also known as Coquette syndrome, or iliac vein, or iliac cable compression syndrome. Um, and uh, May Thurner is, uh, you know, the May Thurner anatomy is basically uh, extrinsic compression of the left iliac vein by the, by the right iliac artery, which, is, which actually crosses over uh, anteriorly. And this is a pretty common con configuration, although the incidence of uh, May Thurner syndrome is uh, more common in females than males. Uh, it's not quite sure, it's not quite uh, known why that's the case, um, but you do see May Thurner uh, syndrome a lot more in females than males. Um, generally, we try to treat these patients uh, aggressively because of um, post-thrombotic syndrome. About 20 to 40 percent of patients can develop, um, who, who have iliofemoral DVT, can develop uh, post-thrombotic syndrome within two years. And about 5 to 10 percent of patients can, can develop severe symptoms of PTS. And the symptoms are pretty much pain, heaviness of their, of their extremity, um, uh, chronic changes in uh, pigmentation and lipodermatosclerosis. Um, in really severe cases, you can also get uh, you know, venous hypertension, 
and ulceration of the skin. So we try to uh, uh, treat these patients pretty aggressively in terms of trying to get them open again and, and stenting them. Um, all right, case number five, um, kind of a companion case, 17-year-old uh, male, history of Crohn's disease, uh, presented with acute right lower extremity swelling. And uh, he had an ultrasound and a CT, which demonstrated uh, extensive right lower extremity acute thrombus. And you can see here uh, the ultrasound, uh, the level of the right iliac vein. Um, you can see just uh, very lack of flow and uh, just um, just complete occlusion of the, of the, vein, of the vein. And again here, you can see the lack of flow. And all the way down to the uh, popliteal vein and to the calf. And so we um, access this patient. This is actually the right lower extremity. Uh, this time the patient is actually in the uh, supine position. And we um, uh, basically placed a catheter, injected contrast. And again, uh, pretty much the same type of approach slowly follow up, uh, follow the uh, contrast all the way up to the pelvis. Uh, uh, basically, you know, we use a, like a comfy catheter and uh, like a stiff glide wire. And very slowly we uh, make our way up into the pelvis there. And here we're injecting a little bit of contrast. And pretty much we, we make our way up into the, um, into the IVC and placed another uh, infusion catheter. Um, so here's the, uh, the marker here, and here's the proximal marker over here. So we're basically infusing this whole area with uh, alteplase. Uh, we brought the patient back the next day, and you know, there's better flow, but again, there's, there's uh, multiple filling defects here. Um, as you can see there, and um, another injection here. And you can just see that it's getting better and better, but you're seeing these persistent areas of, um, of clot. And again, another injection there. And uh, you see this really persistent little focal area right there. And again, uh, this is probably two days after lysis. And again, there's like a focal area of, of, uh, of uh, compression right there. And we also try to kind of mechanically try to open this up um, using AngioJet as well. See that there, and basically what we did was uh, we actually wound up not stenting this patient because um, his uh, presentation. We actually uh, imaged the uh, patient again, or actually not again, but with MRI, um, maybe about a month or two after this procedure. And he actually did pretty well with anticoagulation and uh, compression stockings. Um, but you can see here on cross-sectional imaging that there's a um, compression right in that area, which, which is consistent with, with May Therner. Um, but the thing is this patient presented with right-sided um, swelling, which is very uh, atypical. It's, um, it's thought that Right-sided knee therner is about three to five less common on the left, um, but we just wound up not stenting this patient just because um, it just we we just weren't sure whether it was knee therner or that there was some other etiology such as a tumor or or other other etiology for this right-sided uh, uh, um, thrombosis. 
All right, case number six, another con companion case for the, from, uh, to the previous two cases. 14-year-old male, acute right lower extremity pain and swelling. Ultrasound uh, showed occluding thrombus. Pretty much, um, you know, extensive thrombus all the way down from the iliacs down to the, to the calves, to the, the, to the right calf. And um, notably, there was no flow in the mid and distal IVC. Again, the ultrasound showed thromb complete th thrombosis. Here you see um, non-compression and compression. You see non-compressibility of the veins, of the vein. Lack of blood flow. And the same thing all the way down to the common femoral vein, the superficial femoral vein and the, uh, down to the calf, the peroneal vein. So this patient also went to venography. Uh, we accessed his um, pretty, pretty low down, down in the calf. Um, I think it was the, actually the posterior tibial vein that we accessed. And on injection, you can see just, just massive amounts of clot. And this is uh, going up towards the pelvis. And again, just multiple filling defects compatible with clot. And we actually got up to the uh, lower abdomen and we had this very strange configuration, like this very um, kind of tortuous uh, vessel here. Um, and it was very puzzling, you know, had we just cannulated a, a small collateral vein, collateral vessel, uh, wasn't quite clear what was going on here. Further injection. And basically you're seeing, you don't really see the native um, IVC here. You're just seeing a bunch of um, collateral uh, vessels um, kind of going all the way up to the um, the level of the of the diaphragm, and this was injecting the um, the left side, and again we see um, pacification of the left common iliac vein. But again, you never actually see crossover into the IVC, and we're just getting lumbar and uh, hemiazygous uh, uh, collateral channels. So this patient had cross-sectional imaging. And basically, you know, it was very important in these patients to rule out other etiologies, um, such as tumor or some sort of developmental abnormality. And uh, this, this patient actually turned out to have um, a genesis of the IVC. You can actually see here at the level of the uh, kidneys, uh, you, you never actually see a formed um, IVC. So in this particular patient, what we did was he happened to have um, a developmental abnormality. And basically, you know, this, for this patient, we just uh, anticoagulated him and uh, sent him to uh, hematology uh, for a long-term anticoagulation. So it's very important to look at cross-sectional imaging. Um, you don't really want to be led towards uh, the wrong path. Um, uh, thinking it's May Therner, um, uh, the cross-sectional imaging is, uh, is very uh, useful. Case number seven, a 21-year-old male with history of biliary atresia. Uh, this patient was status post Kasai procedure and had a liver transplant in January of 1997. Um, so this patient actually had um, uh, biliary strictures, uh, which were, which were uh, treated with uh, uh, percutaneous biliary drainage, um, and had multiple drains uh, up until uh, 2009, and then did well thereafter, and then came back to us in 2017 with elevated LFTs. Um, so this is a uh, cholangiogram of a uh, transplanted liver. You can see the uh, Chiba needle accessing the biliary system here with contrast injection. And this is back in uh, 2004, uh, more, more contrast injected. 
And you can see the very complex configuration of the, of the bile ducts. Um, you know, we're filling the bile ducts, but we never actually see a connection of the bile ducts with the, um, with the, uh, with the, with the bowel. So this patient wound up um, with an external drain, basically, to decompress, and then came back at another time uh, for internalization. Um, they were able to get across the anastomosis and into the small, into the small bowel. And uh, this is a balloon catheter, uh, just trying to stretch open the, the biliary stricture. And this was uh, the result here. They were able, they were able to um, leave a catheter across here and serially dilate the stricture um, every, um, usually about every two to four weeks, the patient would come back uh, for balloon dilatation and catheter, uh, catheter exchange. So the patient did pretty well um, for several years and then um, came back to us in 2017 uh, with elevated LFTs. And here basically we're injecting the biliary system again with uh, contrast. And again, you see that there's a very complex configuration here, uh, but no real drainage into the bowel. You can sort of make out a shadow of the bowel here. And again here. But we could never actually see actual uh, contrast draining towards the bowel. So we basically left an external drain for this patient uh, just to decompress things um, and then brought the patient back um, about a month later. And eventually we were able to, we actually ballooned uh, some of these strictures. You can see a balloon cath there and left an external drain for uh, decompression and brought this patient back uh, a month later. And eventually we were able to actually uh, pass a a guide wire across the stricture and into the uh, into the small bowel, as you can see there. So generally, what we do with these patients is um, uh, serial dilatation of the stricture. We bring them back every two to four weeks. Um, you know, through the access, we place a sheath, we place a wire down, and then um, put a, a balloon catheter across to to serially dilate. Um, and we do this every two to four months until um, the, uh, the stricture opens up. And here's more examples of balloon dilatation. And eventually, um, and eventually, uh, this is a work in progress. Eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, get this patient open up, opened up again. So pretty much um, uh, in these patients, we sort of need to look at the long view. Uh, this patient had a, a transplant many, many years ago and had uh, biliary, many biliary drains and uh, dilatations. And this is a very difficult problem, as you can, as you can imagine. Um, so we really need to take a long view on these patients in terms of um, maintaining their uh, uh, maintaining the patency of these, uh, of these strictures. Alrighty. Okay, so this is the last case that we're gonna talk about, case number eight. Um, this is a 14-year-old uh, female, history of megacystis megacolon syndrome, hollow viscous myopathy, and intestinal failure. Uh, the patient had an intestinal transplant in 2009, um, and then subsequently had chronic rejection uh, the patient did have, um, uh, was dependent on TPN and developed portal hypertension due to TPN-induced hepatic cirrhosis. 
uh, and develop some esophageal varices, varices which were non-bleeding. Uh, because of her um, bowel resections, she had an end duodenostomy, duodenostomy. And because of the portal hypertension, she actually had recurrent peristomal uh, bleeding, which required transfusion. And so this uh, patient was referred to us. Um, let me just show some images here. And you can see in this, in this patient, due to the hy portal hypertension, just massively enlarged uh, spleen and liver and ascites. Um, and so we were asked to place a, uh, a TIPS in this patient, a uh, transjugular uh, intrahepatic portal systemic shunt. And here we're just delineating some of the anatomy. Um, basically, we're, the goal was to place, to bypass the portal hypertension by, cause, by creating a, an artificial shunt from the portal system into the systemic, um, from the portal system into the systemic uh, venous system. And you can just see the anatomy here, uh, the hepatic vein, the right hepatic vein coming across this way. And coming a little bit more anteriorly, um, the portal vein, as you can see there. And so we access this patient from a right IJ approach, placed a, a wire down into the, uh, through the heart, into the IVC. Um, and then selected out the right hepatic vein, actually, uh, as you can see here, um, did a venogram. And what we did was we placed a wire down and then in exchange for a balloon catheter, occluded the hepatic vein, and then injected some dilute contrast uh, retrograde across the hepatic sinusoids and into the portal vein. And this was basically to delineate the anatomy, uh, our potential path from the hepatic vein into the, into the portal vein. And as you can see here, uh, we sort of, this is basically a roadmap uh, that we overlay onto our fluoroscopic images. And we basically take a, um, basically a, a large needle. It's uh, basically a trocar needle. A colo, it's called a colopental needle. And we basically cause a, um, an artificial tract, artificial connection between the hepatic vein directly into the, uh, into the portal vein, as you can see there. And that's our contrast injection there. Um, and so the whole reason that we're doing this is because uh, this patient had an end duodenostomy. And you can actually see a lot of varices down here. Uh, there was a lot of uh, back pressure in the portal system causing enlargement of these varices and, and basically uh, bleeding from the varices. And so the goal here is to place a stent to relieve this pressure um, across, that, uh, across that parenchymal tract through the liver. And uh, here we see, and basically here uh, showing the deployment of a stent right there. And there's our injection. Alrighty. So that's a transjugular intrahepatic porosystemic shunt. Alrighty. Okay. So this patient did did pretty well. Uh, she had some relief of her of her uh, bleeding, but she actually came back several months later. Um, the hope was that the shunt uh, would pretty much relieve. Um, the pressure here and that these would go away. Um, but she still had persistent bleeding. And you can actually see on an injection, we actually put a catheter down through the tips into the portal vein. And on an injection, you can actually see a pacification of some of those varices. And we decided to actually go ahead and uh, coil embolize uh, these varices. And you can actually can see um, we just basically just disconnected the, the, the varices from the main, the main uh, portal system. So um, those are some of the cases that um, you would see in a, in a 
you know, typically in a in a PSIR service, um, you know, you don't see the tips very often. That's pretty uh, few and far between. Um, we do see the biliary strictures quite often. Uh, Children's Hospital is a is a pretty active uh, transplant center. Um, but hopefully, you know, that gives you a little bit of a flavor of the types of cases that we do. Um, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, it's a good mix of cases. Uh, we go from anywhere from the premature newborn to up to the teenager and sometimes adults. Um, so I really like the, I really enjoy the, uh, the variety of cases or the variety of the patient population. Um, and also enjoy the, um, uh, the pediatric population working with young, uh, young people. And I really feel like we're um, uh, really um, affecting the lives of, of the patients going forward like, uh, because they have uh, you know, so many years ahead of them uh, to live. Um, and that's pretty much it. I just wanted to uh, emphasize the importance of um, the multidisciplinary approach. And uh, I like to joke with my staff that there's no I in IR, that it's, this is really a team effort that everyone, uh, it really is not possible to do these cases without uh, the support staff, the anesthesiologists and nurses and technicians. And uh, that's pretty much it. All right, thanks Dr. Park. Thank you very much for the interesting cases. Um, we're gonna move on to questions here. And I, I see that uh, Vishnu um, had asked a question here. His question is, how many interventional oncology procedures do you perform in the PEDS population? What procedures are there? And then are, they, are there any unique procedures that you really only see in the PEDS IR field? Sure, absolutely. So um, let me talk about, I guess the second part of the question first. I think the main difference between PEDS IR and adult IR really is um, vascular anomalies, which I didn't talk about uh, today. It might, maybe it might be a, a topic for a future uh, webinar. Uh, but in this patient population, um, as opposed to adults, you, you do see uh, a lot of like vascular anomalies, like high flow uh, AVMs and low flow lesions, like lymphatic malformations and um, uh, uh, venous malformations, thing, things like that. Um, so, so to answer your question, I think the vascular anomalies really is the difference between adult and peds. Um, to answer the other part of the question for interventional oncology, it's pretty much like bread and butter, like um, venous access, like ports, venous access, biopsies. We do very few um, kind of uh, local regional therapy for things like uh, tumors, like liver tumors and things like that. Um, uh, I think there, there are some, some centers where they're trying to do um, things like TACE or Y90 for uh, liver tumors like hepatoblastoma and uh, HCC, uh, which were refractory to, to systemic chemotherapy. Um, we, we don't really do much of that at, uh, children's, at our children's hospital. Uh, but we do, you know, that's something that uh, may be uh, kind of like a growth area that um, we might, we might uh, look into in the future. But those, those tumors are in, in, the, in the pediatric population are very, they're actually pretty rare. So um, there aren't really that many centers uh, doing those types of procedures. Okay. And I, I actually have another question. So um, for those of us, you know, going, uh, in either way, because you said the ways to get into pediatric IR is either going through PEDS radiology, then PEDS IR fellowship, or adult IR and then PEDS IR. Um, mm -hmm. like for instance, if I'm I'm going through the direct uh, or IR DR combined pathway. Later mm -hmm. on, um, I, I think one option would be to do a PEDS IR fellowship. I'm actually really interested in PEDS patients. Um, I saw the, a lot of job postings are saying that they. Uh, look for applicants who have done a PEDS radiology fellowship, then a PEDS IR fellowship. A lot of those are for like academic positions. But then like in between academic and private practice, do you see any like benefits or harms into doing like adult IR than PEDS IR versus PEDS radiology than PEDS IR? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think generally speaking, um, 
most of the uh, PEDS IR jobs are in big academic centers. And in those places, um, generally, like you're pretty much split between doing, um, I mean, a lot of the places they're uh, looking for people who can do diagnostic radiology in addition to PEDS IR. Um, so it really depends on what you're looking for. If you see yourself more as like, uh, you know, a straight IR, adult IR person who also does PEDS, or uh, if you see yourself as a, as, a, as a PEDS diagnostic person who can do procedures as well. Um, but I think in most cases, I think um, for PEDS IR, you'll, you'll be um, working in um, like, a, like a, a large children's hospital. Um, that isn't to say that there are private practices out there that are looking for people who can do PEDS IR. Um, so it really depends on kind of what you're looking for and pretty much, uh, you know, what the job market's going to be. Okay. And then for PEDS, uh, doing the PEDS IR fellowship, do you have an idea of like what percentage go the PEDS radiology route than PEDS IR versus adult than PEDS IR? Um, that's a good question. I, I can't really, I, I really don't know what the numbers might be, but I could make a guess. I think actually the, the, the adult IR and then PEDS IR route, I think is getting more popular. Uh, I'm seeing more and more people doing that route um, nowadays. Um, I think traditionally it's been people who've been doing like, you know, uh, the diagnostic radiology and then, um, and then PEDS IR. Um, so I'm not sure what what's different, you know, currently. But you know, for myself, I, I saw myself more as a, an IR person who also does PEDS as sort of like an extra, you know, like an extra thing. Um, like I had a couple of mentors in my fellowship who, um, you know, who they were adult IR people, but they they sort of had their own niches niches um, in terms of like. Uh, doing vascular anomalies or other PEDS um, procedures, uh, which you know I, I admired and, and um, you know thought would be a, a good route to go. So that's how I decided to do a PEDS IR uh, fellowship as well. Great, thank you. And then we have a Amanda here who is asking if you are willing to share your email in order for everyone to reach out. Sure, absolutely. Um, let me see how to do this. Um, Let's see. Uh, let, let me just call out my email, okay? Hold on a second. I just, uh, I put it, I replied to, mm -hmm. to all on the, uh, on the message board. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, Did everyone read? Can't see it. Yeah, I haven't seen any reply to this yet. Um, where I could, let's see. I'm trying to find this. Or I can just write it out on the um, PowerPoint here. Yeah, or that. Let's see. Or that, yeah. Let's see. Do something like that, I guess. Let's see here. Um, do something with this. There we go. I'll just write it out on there. How's that? That works too. Oh, there you go. Actually. Very good. All right. All right, great. Yeah, and people are saying they see it. Okay, great. Someone else asked here, for medical students in the area, would you be willing to have people shadow you? Sure, that would be. Uh, I've had people. Sh we've had people shadow. We've had people shadow. Um, that that should be no problem. Um, yeah, just shoot me an email, and uh, uh, we could definitely arrange something um, in terms of um, you know for whatever for a week or a day or whatever you're interested in. Really, that should be no problem at all. All right. Let's see. Um, and, and I had another question. So in, in your typical uh, practice, how, what, how, what, what percentage of procedures do you are in adults IR versus percentage in PEDS IR? How is it split? 
I see. So I'm pretty much split 50-50 um, between peds and adults. So like one or two days a week, or sometimes two or three days a week, I'm on the peed side. And then other weeks, like two or three days, like I'm over on the adult side. So it's pretty, I'm pretty much like uh, split 50-50. And then are there a lot of uh, are there a lot of positions in the academic uh, community to allow people to do that to like have a mix of both adults and peds IR procedures? Um, you know that's a good question. Um, I think it really depends on the institution. Um, a lot of places peds is sort of split off from adults, but there are places where you do. Uh, both in the same institution. I think most, actually, I think most places are like that, where um, you know it's, you're, you're doing peds and adult IR, uh, and, and it's the same faculty. Um, when you go into like a children's hospital, like you're a little bit, uh, if it's like a standalone children's hospital, you're sort of separated from the adult side. Um, uh, but it really depends on the institution. I'm, I'm sure there's like pretty much the full gamut of uh, variation. All right. And then we have Jesus here who asked, is, is PSIR also moving towards clinical with actual clinic days? For clinic days, you know, we actually, um, right now we're not really, you, you mean in terms of like um, having like, a, like an actual clinic for like, like um, you know, we don't really have like a clinic day per se in terms of, um, actually, that's not true. On the vascular anomaly side, we do have a dedicated clinic at, um, at Children's. Um, basically, every Thursday, uh, there's an all-day clinic for just, just for vascular anomalies. Um, so for that specialized area, we do have clinics. Um, but for the other stuff, we, don't, we, don't, we generally don't um, have clinics. Um, but uh, that's something that we're working on possibly uh, starting up. I see. So one, one of the things, I guess, um, maybe what House is asking, the, the SIR um, leadership is, is um, having the training programs for, for adult IR uh, go towards a clinical practice model where we mm -hmm. um, admit patients, follow them up longitudinally, have clinic, dedicated mm -hmm. clinic days, um, following them as inpatients, as outpatients. So I, I guess he's, he's asking if PEDS IR mm -hmm. is also following that kind of practice model. Yeah, I can I can speak for I guess what we do at children at Children's of Pittsburgh. We generally um, basically um, you know generally we don't have our own admitting service. We generally admit to or we get referrals from um, you know the, the pediatricians or the surgical service. So they they tend to be the primary um, you know the primary uh, uh, providers, and we generally don't. Uh, like for example, for vascular anomalies case, uh, we would do the procedure, but then we would actually admit to uh, like plastic surgery or whoever the referring uh, service is. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and does anyone else have questions here? I had a question, Dr. Park, this is Jamal. Um, what brought you towards uh, PEDS IR? Um, seems like, uh, uh, for me, I didn't I didn't know about it until I, I met you actually. Sure. Um, mentor, or did you know about it before? Yeah. So I actually, um, yeah, I actually kind of got into PEDSIR sort of indirectly as well. Like, um, you know, I did have a couple of mentors in uh, in my adult IR fellowship at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, so like Sally Mitchell and Clifford we Clifford Weiss over there, they actually um, did a lot of the peds, like the vascular anomalies. Um, and it was, a, it was, you know, it was a good experience. It was a good year of fellowship, but I, I really didn't feel comfortable uh, kind of managing those cases. Like I, I felt like it would be great to have a niche, um, uh, but I, I I, I really wanted um, some of some extra like training in the area, and they happen to have a position open in, in Boston, um, and they do a lot of these cases, like the vascular anomalies cases there. So it just um, it just some it was an opportunity that just sort of 
kind of opened up and it was there and it was it seemed like a good opportunity pretty much and uh, yeah, that was pretty much it I mean it is an extra it is an extra year of um, of training um, but it, I guess my approach or my philosophy was that um, you, know, you don't really get a chance to uh, uh, you know once you're out in practice and if you wanted to do this type of work it's a lot harder to to sort of learn on the fly than to um, kind of have a dedicated year in feeds IR so you know it, it seemed like a good opportunity for me and, and uh, it's not for everyone it, it is it is definitely another uh, like an extra year of training and then we have Shannon who asked uh, do you think there is any niche for neonatal IR specifically neonatal IR that's a good question um, um, I'm not quite sure, you know, I, I, don't, I really don't know, to be honest with you. That's something that, you know, the thoughts cross my mind, or I, I'm not really sure what, uh, where, what the status is in terms of, like, people doing those kinds of procedures. Um, but that's definitely something, you know, um, maybe down the road um, might be an interesting area to look at. All right, and I think, uh, does anyone else have questions? Feel free to type them in our questions box here. All right, so if not, I guess we can um, complete the webinar here. All okay, right, so, great. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Park, and thanks, Jamal, for, for coordinating this for us. Sure oh, thing, Mike. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. All right, thank you, guys. All right. So again, oh, everyone, uh, this this webinar is recorded and will be available on YouTube uh, afterwards. Give us a couple of days to get it uploaded, and then you'll be able to access it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our our speaker, Dr. Park, and our coordinator from the PEDS service line, Jamal Jefferson. And I, I hope everyone has a nice evening. <laughs>